Good morning. Welcome to 2016, and welcome to the first grand rounds of this year of the Department of Medicine. Um, we have a special guest today from Vanderbilt University, but uh, before that, a few historical facts. As you know, every year we, uh, and every Thursday, we talk a little bit of what figures or events that have happened on this day in the past, just to keep us humble and remind us that what we do today is based on the sacrifice and efforts of a lot of people that came before us. So we remember Sophia Luisa Jex Blake. You should remember that name, particularly the ladies in the room. She made it possible for women to enter the medical profession to practice medicine and surgery. She was the first British female doctor. She worked for years to get Parliament to allow women to obtain license in that country. And she then developed a medical school that she opened uh, in London in 1874 and another medical school in 1886 for women. Uh, so that's important. Uh, Archer Gordon, today is a day about critical care. So Archer Gordon uh, helped us with the CPR technique. And it's important because many of our patients in the ICU ultimately end up having either CPR there or CPR being the justification, or cardiac arrest being the justification for them to be in critical care. And from 1949 to the 50, early 50s, he spent a lot of time doing research and investigating how to deliver oxygen into patients who were unconscious. And that laid the foundation for 1956 for James Elan to publish the first scientific paper showing that he, putting a tube in, he can actually deliver oxygen into the lung of an unconscious, non-breathing patient. George Washington Cryle died on this day in 1943. American surgeon who first studied the significance of surgical shock. A friend of his had a car accident, lost his legs, and developed shock and died during the surgery. And he started thinking about this concept of blood pressure, shock, and life during surgery. Something that we would think now it's uh, pretty obvious. This is 1943. And he started pushing the idea of the swing monitor while you're doing surgery to make sure that the blood pressure was sustained during that time. But I want to finish with Tom Petty, not the singer, not the singer. Tom Petty is uh, the godfather of COPD and the one who discovered in 1960s uh, acute lung injury or described acute, uh, what he called adult respiratory distress syndrome. He came to Kentucky. This is the history with Kentucky. He came to Kentucky to help with Governor John Brown. Governor Brown actually had cardiac surgery, lasted too long, developed complications, and went into acute lung injury, for which he was hospitalized in the U.K. They needed help. And the wife of Governor Brown called Petty, who answered the phone after coming from a fishing trip. He was well known for being a fisherman. And he had been two weeks out of town, and this woman calls him and says, I need you here. And he says, I just can't do that. I have my patients waiting. And uh, the governor of uh, the wife of the governor wasn't too kind and said, is there something wrong with the communication the telephone, sir? And so he was here that week, took care of Governor Brown, who ended up having a tracheostomy and stayed a prolonged stay in the ICU. And during his conversations after that with uh, Governor Brown, there was a discussion about how to deal with patients who had prolonged stays that did not need a critical care unit but needed to be ventilated for a long period of time. And that concept evolved into chronic ventilator units. And Governor Brown becomes one of the co-founders of Vancouver Hospital, which ends up being Kindred, which is in town. So with that, I want to introduce our guest speaker of today, Dr. Shettles, who's here, and several others have been pushing for us to bring somebody talked about a cognitive impairment and delirium and other impact of of chronic um, ICU stays. And uh, we call Vanderbilt because Vanderbilt is very well known for this area of research, and they sent us a stellar candidate uh, to talk to us about this, Dr. Nathan Brummel, who is um, obtained his undergraduate degree from Creighton University. Uh, he did his medical school at University of Missouri. He went to Vanderbilt for his master's in clinical investigation, went back to Ohio State to do pulmonary critical care, came back to Vanderbilt to do postgraduate, uh, postdoctoral fellowship, and did pulmonary and critical care uh, uh, studies there, and ultimately became faculty just in 2013. And despite his uh, 
short track record. He's already developed a name for himself in this area. And I'll just give you a few of his assignments. He's published in this area. He's funded by the National Institutes of Aging in this area. Um, he is chair of the American Thoracic Society Critical Care Assembly Aging and Geriatrics and Critical Care Working Group. He was in the writing committee of the NIA for incorporating frailty in the specialties. He was a member of the Society for Critical Care Medicine involved in clinical practice guidelines committee for the management of pain, agitation, delirium, early mobilization, and sleep, and adults in the intensive care unit. I can go on and on and on. So Nathan has been quite active, and hopefully he'll uh, provide us some new insight that will help us deliver better care in the ICUs to our patients. He's going to be running after this to round in the ICU at the VA, and he'll be in the afternoon to talk to us a little bit more. So, Nathan, welcome. Thank you all very much. And it's interesting that you bring up uh, Dr. Petty because in a lot of ways, he's not only the godfather of COPD, but he prompted a lot of this kind of research. He wrote an editorial called Suspending Life or Prolonging Death in the ICU. It was published in Chest back in 1998 where he basically derided us ICU clinicians for keeping patients deeply sedated. And he said in there, the only way I know my patients are alive is not by looking at them, but by seeing their vital signs on the monitor. So he really prompted us to get back to the way things used to be when you're talking about patients being having a tracheostomy and perhaps being awake and alert and interacting with their, with their families. So thank you very much for the nice introduction. And it's my privilege to be here today to talk to you about some of the long-term consequences of critical illness. As Dr. Roman alluded to, I'm funded through the NIH. I don't have any industry-related conflicts of interest. These are the doors to the Vanderbilt Medical ICU where I work. And through these doors and doors like them around the world pass literally millions of patients whose lives are in the balance. And for many years, these patients had very high mortality. And so we as ICU clinicians would celebrate when a patient survived. And when the patient left the ICU, we would see these doors as a finish line. We had done our job. But here's the thing. Mortality from critical illness is, has significantly declined over the last couple of decades. And what we're learning is that those doors aren't the finish line. In many ways, they're the start line for our patients. Patients who leave the ICU now, their bodies hurt. They don't function like they used to. They can't think clearly. They suffer from depression and PTSD. Their lives and those of their families are forever changed by the time they spent in the ICU. And so I'd like to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking with you about the long-term consequences of critical illness because the number of ICU survivors is increasing. And these syndromes that these patients are suffering with, they suffer often in silence because we as clinicians don't often recognize them. So to do this, I'd like to accomplish three goals this morning. The first is to review long-term cognitive impairment and disability associated with survival from critical illness. The second is to use a model called the vulnerability hypothesis that we use in our work to understand better risk factors for the development of these poor outcomes. And then I'd like to share with you some of our early work into rehabilitation of cognitive impairment after critical illness. So mortality from critical illness is decreasing. It's a trend that makes our work at Vanderbilt possible. These data illustrate what I'm talking about here. These are from Maya Kakonen, who is a researcher down at Nash University in Melbourne, Australia. And in Australia and New Zealand, they have a complete registry of all the ICU admissions with detailed information collected. So she was able to use over a thousand ICU, or, pardon me, over a million ICU admissions from 2000 and 2012 and apply a standardized definition of severity of illness and, and sepsis. Her interest was in whether sepsis mortality was worse. But she looked at sepsis and non-sepsis mortality. And then she created this adjusted odds ratio for mortality using the year 2000 as a reference. And you can see that mortality has decreased significantly each year from 2000 to 2012. And in fact, if we take the number here, the odds ratio of death in 2012 was roughly half that of what it was in 2000. In this country, it's estimated that 3.5 million adults survive a critical illness each year. And that number is increasing, as these data from my friend Jack Awashina's group at the University of Michigan show us. In this study, Jack used Medicare beneficiary data to look at the number of ICU survivors or survivors of severe sepsis aged 65 years and older over time. 
So we have the number of survivors here on the y-axis and, and the year here on the x-axis. And you can see that in 1999, there were roughly 100,000 older adults who survived for at least three years after a hospitalization for severe sepsis. But by 2008, that number had increased to over 225,000. And a similar trend for those who are surviving five years. So not only is mortality from acute critical illness declining, we're seeing an increased number of survivors who are living long term. But as I alluded to in my introduction, all is not well with these patients. Jack Washington also published this. He paired his Medicare data with a study called the Health and Retirement Study. Health and Retirement Study is a, a population-based study of aging where patients are assessed every couple of years for their cognitive and physical functioning. And it allowed him to determine the effect of hospitalization for severe sepsis on these patients' cognition. And so what you can see is that in, we have the years before sepsis here and then in the gray box after sepsis, and looking at the proportion of patients who are cognitively impaired. And the degree of cognitive impairment is indicated by mild cognitive impairment in the blue bars and moderate to severe with the red bars. And you can see that in the years before hospitalization for severe sepsis, those rates of cognitive impairment are relatively flat. But afterwards, there's a dramatic increase in the proportion of patients with moderate to severe cognitive impairment. In fact, it tripled in just in that year after hospitalization and persisted for three years afterwards. He also looked at ability to carry out basic and instrumental activities of daily living, the things that allow us to live independently, like get dressed, eat a meal, cook a meal, balance our checkbooks, those sorts of things. And what you can see, again, looking before sepsis and after sepsis, is that those patients who are completely independent, no problems whatsoever in carrying out their activities of daily living, acquired a one to two disabilities in ADLs and IADLs in the years following their hospitalization for severe sepsis. Similarly, those who had one or two impairments prior to being hospitalized now had three to five after they were hospitalized for severe sepsis. And those who in the red bar there had severe disability prior couldn't really get much worse. So do patients really care about how they're able to function? I think that they do. I think these data suggest that they do. This is a study done by Terry Freed, published now in uh, 2002 in the New England Journal. And she asked patients with chronic illnesses such as heart failure, COPD, and cancer what their treatment preferences would be given the probability of certain side effects. And those side effects that she studied were death with a low burden treatment, death with a high burden treatment like being in the hospital for a long time, functional impairment, and cognitive impairment. And I think not surprisingly, if the probability of those outcomes was zero, most patients said, sure, I would undergo some therapy to do that. But as she increased the probability of these outcomes towards near certainty, you can see that the number of patients who were willing to undergo treatment decreased significantly. And more importantly, patients said, if I was going to be cognitively impaired or physically impaired, more of those patients said, I wouldn't want to go under, undergo treatment. And so you could argue that patients are prioritizing the ability to function independently, even above survival. <clears throat> this is a patient of ours named Melissa. And Melissa was a 50-year-old woman who came to the Vanderbilt Medical ICU back in 2009 during the H1N1 flu epidemic. And she was in the ICU for about two weeks, was on the ventilator for 12 days or so, she suffered multiple organ failures, including delirium, while she was in the ICU. And Melissa worked at the development office at Vanderbilt, and so she sought out our group, given our, our interest in this area, to see if we could help her after she had returned home and was struggling with the problems of the ICU. And her story, she's been gracious enough to share her story not only with you all, but with others through this, this article in the Vanderbilt uh, Medical Magazine. We all get these things. But she, there's a nice story in, in there called Undone in the ICU, and you can Google her story. But I'm going to allow her to tell it because I think it's, it's far more striking than I could ever do. My brain changed... Um incredibly you know I'd been through chemo brain and gone back to work and and it was you know I was not quite as quick with things but it really didn't hamper me to a 
disabling level. This stay and everything that I went through did. We do we do a lot of list. We do a lot of whiteboard, like is right over there on the the wall where it's we're going to do this first and then we're going to do this. I've lost all sense of internal time, so I can't um, gauge how long it's going to take me to do anything. She's very intelligent. There's a sense at times that it's inside her and she's wanting to get out what she's thinking, but it's not lining up. It's almost like it's running in jelly in, instead of oil. Somebody is like, why can't, you know, they have that look on, you know, I just told you my name and you're asking me again. I laugh and say, well, I, you know, I got really sick and my Velcro kind of melted. You know, because now my short-term memory it just doesn't stick. I'm still not um, back up to uh, the strength level that I was before I got sick. Not because I haven't had enough time, but primarily because part of what came along with the after effects were um, a clinical depression and, uh, you know, I I've been di diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, PTSD. At church, we, we choose where we sit. We sit to the back so that um, I'm not in front of all the people breathe, that are breathing. <laughs> you know, if somebody's caught, we, we, we will get up and move. They did a good job of preparing us, but the reality of how little she was able to do was a real surprise. In fact, when we came back here, I had to build a ramp so that she could get in and out of the house. She couldn't go down two, we have two steps coming into our house. She couldn't do two steps. I was working before I had this. I didn't have the same processing properties that I had had before. And I couldn't go back to doing the kind of work I was doing before. She worked in a job that she did lots of work in Excel spreadsheets and lots of very complicated uh, gathering of information and distilling it and reporting it and handling all kinds of uh, n not uh, easy tasks. And that would terrify her right now if she had to sit down and, and do that kind of work. It's just, it, it, it's just not something that's, that's possible. I never dreamed after having had leukemia and done two years with it and chemo and all that and um, I, I never dreamed that anything else could be worse and this was so much worse. It was more spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, intellectually challenging than, than, than I mean than even cancer. If, if you presented me with ARDS and cancer, leukemia, I would choose the leukemia. Well, I think her story really encapsulates what we're hearing increasingly from patients who contact us and, and our, our group and others around the country. And so the term post-intensive care syndrome has been coined to sort of describe this constellation of symptoms that patients are developing. And it describes the cognitive, physical, and mental health impairments that patients are suffering. And we're still unpacking what post-intensive care syndrome means, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later in the talk. But the primary reason this, this term was coined was to raise awareness among clinicians. So we talk about the post-intensive care syndrome. I'd like to share with you now a little bit of our work on understanding better some of the cognitive and disability outcomes of these patients through the use of the vulnerability hypothesis. And for those of you geriatricians in the room, the vulnerability hypothesis is very familiar to you. We've borrowed it. Um, it's described a way to describe how geriatric syndromes and, and the impairments that we're seeing develop. And it, and it allows us to understand how impairments develop by incorporating a patient's underlying vulnerability in combination with an acute stressor. And so we'll use this framework for the rest of the talk. And the primary acute stressor that I'll talk about today and that we're interested in studying down at Vanderbilt is delirium in the ICU. 
And delirium is a syndrome of inattention that's characterized by a fluctuating mental status. Very common in the ICU, upwards of 60 to 80% of patients on a mechanical ventilator will suffer delirium at some point in their ICU stay. And my mentor, Wes Ely at Vanderbilt, was one of the first people to rigorously study the long-term outcomes of this syndrome in the ICU. And you may be asking yourself, how did a pulmonologist get interested in the brain? Well, Wes, when he was early in his career, was studying ventilator weaning. Why don't people come off the ventilator? And it turns out that it wasn't their lungs that was keeping them on the ventilator, but something going on in their brains. And so he developed and validated the confusion assessment method for the ICU, or the CAM ICU, which is one of the most widely used delirium screening tools across the world, translated into over 25 languages. And then in 2004, he published this paper in JAMA describing the association between delirium in the ICU and long-term mortality, mortality at six months later. So we always thought, right, I learned this in medical school, delirium is a characterized by its fluctuating course and it's, and it's self-limited. But it turns out that that problem in critically ill patients is predictive of long-term outcomes. And, and one of Wes's mentees, Margaret Prasani, went on to study how long a patient is delirious is also associated with one-year mortality. And you can see that patients there in the yellow line that never had mortality had the highest survival probability and contrast that with those who had 10 days of delirium in the ICU had the, most, had the highest mortality. But our group, in, you know, in keeping with that trend that I talked about in critical illness where mortality is decreasing, but these other outcomes, cognitive and physical outcomes, are becoming more important, our group began to evaluate these. And we did so in the context of a randomized trial of a sedation weaning protocol and, and ventilator weaning protocol, known as the Awake and Breathing trial or the ABC trial. I understand last night from dinner that you all use this where you turn off the sedation every morning and see if patients can breathe on their own in your own ICU. And that study showed that patients who were treated with that intervention came off a ventilator four days sooner than compared to those who were treated under usual care. And the surprising thing is that mortality was 14% less in that intervention group. And so that made this type of work possible. And we started to evaluate cognitive outcomes and functional outcomes in these patients built into that randomized controlled trial. And so in these preliminary studies that Tim Gerard and I have published in the critical care medicine, Tim looking at long-term cognitive impairment and myself looking at disability, we've shown an association between the duration of delirium, the number of days a patient suffers delirium in the ICU, and these long-term outcomes. So here in this preliminary study, only 52 patients in this follow-up arm at one year using a battery of neuropsychological tests where the score is adjusted to a mean T-score, you can see that the longer patients, the more days of delirium, the worse off people score on these battery of cognitive tests. And similarly, when we looked at the ability to carry out those basic activities of daily living, patients who had more days of delirium in the ICU were more likely to be disabled one year later. So we're seeing long-term effects of this acute brain syndrome in the ICU or delirium in the ICU. And so those preliminary studies led us to conduct a larger multi-center trial known as the Brain ICU Study. And in the brain ICU study, we enrolled 821 patients with respiratory failure or shock from the medical and surgical ICUs at two centers down in Nashville. We enrolled patients who were 18 years and older, and we enrolled them early in the ICU. And we collected detailed physiologic and pharmacologic data throughout the duration of their hospitalization. We then assessed patients in person using neuropsychological tests at 3 and 12 months. Now, we were interested in what was the effect of critical illness, and more specifically, delirium on cognitive impairment later. So we excluded patients with severe dementia, and we had to use proxy screening tools for that. But we excluded a number of patients with severe dementia because we weren't interested in does critical illness make your Alzheimer's disease or your mild cognitive impairment worse. And so the results of this study, the Brain ICU study, were published in the New England Journal back in 2013. So in this study, as I said, we enrolled 821 patients. They were mostly middle-aged white men. We, exclu let's see, we excluded those with severe dementia, but we still had 6% who had pre-existing cognitive impairment of some form. Now, I want you to remember that number, 6%, because it's important for later. Patients had pretty good severity of illness with an Apache 2 score of 25. Now, the primary neuropsychological test that these patients underwent, underwent was a test called the R-bands, which is short for the repeatable battery for the assessment of neuropsychological status. 
and it covers a variety of domains, including attention, memory, visual, spatial, and language skills. And the, the education-adjusted normal score would be 100 with a standard deviation of 15 on either side. Now, the interesting thing about the r is it's been used extensively in Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, and TBI. So it allowed us for the first time to place this cognitive impairment that we were hearing about from our patients and we had seen in our preliminary studies in the context of these, of these other well-studied illnesses. And now remember that there's only 6% of these patients who had any form of cognitive impairment as best we could detect going into the study. At three months and 12 months, a full quarter and 20% had ex scored extremely low on this r band score. And if you see down here, scores less than 70 are equivalent to an Alzheimer's disease. So, so these are patients, the majority of whom are coming in without cognitive impairment, but a full quarter are leaving with <coughs> cognitive impairment that is as severe as Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that then, you know, 80% of these patients scored low average or worse on this test. So it's a pretty significant cognitive impairment these patients are facing. Now we thought, boy, there's a lot of people with cognitive impairment. Maybe these are all, you know, our median age was 61. Maybe there was just some subclinical cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease that we were detecting on these tests. So we stratified these scores by age. And so what I'm showing you here is on the y-axis, the R-bands global score, again with an education rather adjusted mean of 100, standard deviation of 15 on either side, indicated by that gray box. And here we're looking at box and whisker plots. So the white lines indicate the median. The top of the box is the 75th percentile. The bottom of the box is the 25th percentile. And what you, and then we've, sorry, and then we've stratified these by age. So 30 and 40 year olds, 50 to 64, and over the age of 65. And this was really surprising to us, that these 30 and 40 year olds coming into the ICU were leaving with cognitive impairment that was at least a standard deviation below what we'd expect for their education level. And if we put those in context, here's traumatic brain injury, this white line going all the way across. Nearly half of them have cognitive impairment as severe as a traumatic brain injury, right? This is in the news a lot with these concussions and everything else. But we also thought, we've all seen these 30 and 40 year olds in the ICU, right? They're the ones who've been on dialysis for 20 years. They've got multiple comorbidities. Maybe they just, their brains are different. So we stratified it once again by the number of comorbidities. So again, here I'm showing you the R-bands global score, the education adjusted score with a standard deviation on either side, stratified by age, but also by the number of comorbidities. No comorbidities, one to two, and greater than three. And starting out down here, I don't think anyone's surprised, right? Older adults with multiple comorbidities come through the ICU and they develop cognitive impairment. Not really shocking there. But I wanna draw your attention now to that upper left-hand box. 30 and 40 year olds, with no prior comorbidities coming out of the ICU with pretty severe cognitive impairment. Half of them, at least a standard deviation below what we'd expect on that battery of tests. So why are these patients developing cognitive impairment? We started to look at risk factors, and our primary risk factor of interest was duration of delirium, based off that pilot study that we had seen. And so to model the association between the days of delirium in the ICU and these long-term cognitive outcomes, we use multivariable regression and adjusted for a bunch of potential confounders of, of cognition one year later, including age, education, gender, APOE4, their pre-illness cognitive status, their risk of stroke, and their comorbidities, and a bunch of things that happened to patients in the ICU, such as how sick they were, what drugs they got while they were in the ICU, how long they were in coma, and did they have significant hypoxemia while in the ICU. And we found a very similar trend as we saw in our pilot study. This time with 382 patients at one year, our band's global score, the longer you were delirious, the worse off your cognitive function was. And in fact, if we compare scores with patients who had five days, sorry, five days of delirium to patients who had one day of delirium, the 75th to the 25th percentile, that change in score was the equivalent of about seven and a half points or almost a half standard deviation. You know, you recall Melissa was talking about her inability to go back to work and do her spreadsheet work. That's sort of a thing we call executive functioning. They're the things that allow us to do our higher order mental tasks. So we used a test called Trails B to establish uh, that. And we also saw a similar trend or a similar significant change with duration of delirium and executive functioning. 
So, those, so delirium is the strongest predictor in that analysis of these long-term cognitive impairments, whether it's global cognition using the R-bands or executive functioning using the trails B. So I'd like to shift our focus now a little bit to some of the work we've been doing lately on patient vulnerability, right? We saw that you know, even, even patients who had no delirium were still scoring pretty low on this. Why might that be the case? Well, we're looking a little bit more at patient vulnerability. And what do I mean by vulnerability? Well, essentially, it's, it's conceptualizing patients' physiologic reserve. We don't necessarily have a good measure for that, but vulnerability is a concept that we can use to, to capture that. So if we have a patient with low vulnerability, you can see the reserve that they have before they tip over into failure is quite wide compared to a patient who's highly vulnerable where that reserve is narrow. So when that patient's faced with an, with a patient with low vulnerability is faced with an acute stressor, they have the compensatory mechanisms to be able to restore homeostasis and maintain normal organ function. Contrast that with a patient with high vulnerability, that same, that, those are the same size arrows as this one, so the same acute stressor tips them over into organ failure and they decompensate. So clinically, how do we capture vulnerability? Well, you can use the clinical syndrome known as frailty. And frailty is a multidimensional syndrome that's characterized by that loss of physiologic reserve that results in the inability to maintain or regain homeostasis in the setting of acute stress. So let's look at that graphically here. If we have a patient's functional abilities here, independent at the top, disabled at the bottom, and we'll compare two patients, one with frailty and one who is not frail. And, the, and you can see the patient who's not frail, when they hit that acute stressor, they suffer a little bit of a decline. Think of one of us getting a pneumonia or something like that. You know, we're a little weak for a couple days afterwards, after we recover. Um, but we ultimately recover back to our baseline and go on about our way. That same pneumonia is a much bigger deal to a patient with frailty who already starts out with worse functional abilities and suffers a dramatic drop, perhaps even into becoming disabled in those activities of daily living like we were seeing. And their recovery period is much more prolonged, and they may not recover all the way to their baseline. And there's lots of different ways to measure frailty. Because of the acute illness of our patients, we relied on this thing called the clinical frailty scale, which is a well-validated uh, clinical frailty scale done by uh, Ken Rockwood up at Dalhousie University in, in Canada. And the clinical frailty scale asks you as a clinician to use your clinical judgment based off what you know of the patient, their medical history, how you see them functioning to rate a patient from very fit. One is the very fit. These are people who are out exercising. They're the most healthy and robust for their age group all the way through to very severely frail and terminally ill. Now, when this scale was originally derived and validated, it only went up to a scale of, of seven, so severely frail. And patients in higher scores indicate worse frailty, with a score of five or more indicating the presence of the frailty syndrome. And so we use this to look at vulnerability in our ICU population in the brain ICU, but there's also a sister study with the brain ICU, which was conducted at our VA and three other, or two other VAs throughout the country. So we were able to bring those two trials together for this paper and look at clinical frailty, assess the ICU admission, and it's and it's predicting of outcomes. So we used, again, multivariable regression to determine that association between frailty and long-term outcomes, adjusting for a variety of things that patients come into the ICU with, age, education, sex, ADL and IADL function, pre-illness cognitive function, as well as a bunch of things that happen to them in the ICU, including severity of illness, doses of sedatives, severe sepsis, mechanical ventilation, coma, and delirium. And after adjusting for all those potential confounders of outcomes, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Sorry. So we enrolled in this, in this combined cohort 1,000 patients, so up from the 821. 546 we assessed at three months and 467 at one year. Again, patients were mostly middle-aged white men with a high school education. But we found that one out of three of them were frail. And that's a pretty dramatic increase. I think if you look at community-dwelling older adults, the, the studies show you that's about 10 to 12 percent of clinical or of clinically or, sorry, pardon me community dwelling older adults will have clinical frailty so this sort of makes sense though that people with frailty will have a higher or will have a higher proportion of patients that come to the ICU with frailty if you're not able to compensate for an illness you're more likely to end up in a, in an area where you need organ support and those sorts of things <laughs> patients were pretty acutely ill with a patchy score of 24 and hardly any disability or cognitive impairment at enrollment 
And so after adjusting for all those things that patients brought with them to the ICU, as well as how sick they were, how long they were on the ventilator, delirious, comatose, all those sorts of things, we found that frailty, something you can identify when patients come into your ICU, was independently predictive of increased mortality at one year. Such that if we look at patients in the 75th percentile who had a score of four, so in our population, the, the median score was, was a, or sorry, in this one, it was, it was four with a, with a 75th percentile of five and a 25th percentile of three. So if we compare patients with a score of five to those of three, their mortality was 54% greater at one year, adjusted for all those other outcomes. When we looked at other long-term outcomes, frailty among those who survived was also predictive of being disabled. Here, looking at the score on their, their probability of having disability and in instrumental activities of daily living, you can see that as the clinical frailty scale score goes up, so does their odds of being disabled. Interestingly, when we looked at cognitive outcomes, frailty in and of itself was not associated with long-term cognitive impairment or disability and basic activities of daily living. And one of the possibilities there is that there's a competing risk now that we have with death. So maybe the patients who, had, who were frail and would have developed cognitive impairment instead died. And we're still trying to tease that out statistically. But frailty did predict worse health-related quality of life in terms of physical functioning. So patients rated their, their quality of life from a physical standpoint worse, the higher the frailty scale score. So returning now to our, our post-intensive care syndrome cognitive impairment, physical impairment, and mental health impairment. Not a lot is known about how often do these things co-occur. We're still unpacking what post-intensive care syndrome means and do patients, you know, is there a subset of patients who are more likely to develop physical impairments than cognitive impairments? So we're still teasing that out. But one of the questions we asked in that combined brain and mind ICU cohort was how often did these syndromes overlap? So again, we had the, the combined cohorts and we followed them up in person at three and 12 months. And they underwent a battery of neuropsychological and physical functioning and mental health tests. And to, to understand how often these syndromes overlapped, we created a, eight different categories using these cutoffs. So cognitive impairment, R bands of less than or equal to 78, which is a standard deviation and a half below our education norms. CATS ADL score of one or greater, indicating disability in at least one activity of daily living and the Beck Depression Inventory 2 score of greater than 13, indicating a, a high likelihood of clinical depression. And we categorize patients across the spectrum here, so ranging from no impairments to impairments in all three. And this cohort, so we, and we excluded patients, by the way, who had any problems before they came into the ICU. So this is only patients who had problems coming into, or, or new problems after the ICU that they did not have before. And so again, middle-aged white males, a lower prevalence of clinical frailty than we just saw in our larger cohort. And again, no disability or cognitive impairment among these patients. So when we look at these patients at three months, we've actually found that 36% of them came out of the ICU and did well. And that overlapping symptoms, so having both cognitive impairment and disability, was actually relatively rare, occurring in less than 10%, with the most common being cognitive impairment and depression. So those overlapped pretty well. And then similar findings at one year, slightly higher proportion coming out of the ICU with, without any problems. And again, overlapping symptoms um, were pretty rare. And so this may have some implications for us as we go forward designing rehabilitation trials. There's also work to be done in identifying specific risk factors for these uh, specific impairments. But we also looked at these patients, looking at kind of another way of vulner looking at vulnerability is looking at the patients who are robust, the ones who are going to come out of the ICU without problems. So here we looked at the, this group, this circle of patients. And we wanted to find out what factors were associated with those who come out of the ICU without any problems. And so we, again, did multivariable regression using a, adjusting for a bunch of different potential confounders of outcomes, age, education, frailty, sepsis, delirium, and mechanical ventilation. And the good news for everyone in this room is that years of education was the single strongest predictor of coming through a critical illness and doing well. You can see here we have the probability of remaining picks free compared to years of education and a nice, you know, we're all out here, right? 16 to 18 years of education. So, so if anyone gets critically ill, they don't worry too much about what I'm talking about today. Um, and then the other risk factors, so frailty, delirium, and severe sepsis were, you know, were trends towards actually having worse outcomes, so consistent with what we'd seen 
prior. But they did not predict those outcomes at one year. So now I'd like to talk with you about some work we've done on rehabilitation, some preliminary trials of rehabilitation for this long-term cognitive impairment that we're seeing for our patients. So rehabilitation in the ICU is a relatively new phenomenon, or I guess it's one we've rediscovered in the last seven or eight years or so. And that was primarily launched by this study done by collaborators of ours, Bill Schweikert and J.P. Kress at University of Chicago, called Animation, where they provided early physical and occupational therapy for patients in the ICU, beginning within the first 72 hours. You all, if you guys do this in your ICU, mobilize patients when they're still acutely ill? It's very tough, tough to do, but, but in this study... They, again, randomized patients to early physical and occupational therapy starting the first 72 hours of ICU admission continued throughout their hospitalization. And you can see that the proportion of patients who resumed functional independence at discharge was greater in that group compared to usual care, which was when we as clinicians thought we should call in our physical and occupational therapists. So they had a greater proportion of patients who returned to that functional independence. And this is one of the areas that there's been a lot of recent research on whether we can prevent some of the physical impairments from patients. Well, our group, primarily being interested in the long-term cognitive outcomes, conducted the RETURN trial, which was an in-home combined physical and cognitive rehabilitation program. Patients underwent physical and occupational therapy delivered via telehealth, and then we performed in-person cognitive rehabilitation using a program called goal management training, which we borrowed from our colleagues who study traumatic brain injury and stroke. And the goal management training has two primary uh, emphases. The first is to create an awareness of deficits. A, long, a lot of times, patients aren't aware that they're not thinking clearly or that they um, are having trouble with multi-step tasks, those kinds of things. And you can imagine that, for example, if someone's driving, that might be problematic. And so it teaches them a compensatory strategy, such as the stop and think technique where a patient will take a complex task and divide it up into simplified subtasks to be able to accomplish that task and monitor their behavior as they go. So in this study, we enrolled patients, enrolled 22 patients at hospital discharge. And we had them perform this thing called the tower test, which asked them to move different discs to build towers. And there's rules about what discs you can move, and you can only move one at a time, and you can't put a bigger one on top of a smaller one. So it requires a lot of thinking and planning to be able to accomplish this. And so you can see that patients who were randomized to the cognitive and physical rehab here in the red triangles compared to those in usual care had very similar scores at hospital discharge. And after 12 weeks at three-month follow-up, those patients in the usual care group had a very similar score to what they did when they left the hospital. However, Patients in this cognitive and physical rehab group actually improve their scores. Now, you, now you're looking at this and you're saying, wait, there's, there's fewer triangles over here than there are over here, and there's a bunch up here, and maybe these are all. Well, it turns out these people up here were doing so well that they, were, they, they said, you know what, thanks for your rehab program, but I don't need it. I'm dropping out of the study. And it was actually these patients down here who improved their scores. So, that, so goal management training or cognitive rehabilitation in general after the ICU may be one way by which to improve cognitive functioning among these patients. Now, I was interested as an ICU doctor on what can we do in the ICU for patients. And so I conducted the uh, ACT ICU study, Activity and Cognitive Therapy in the ICU. And the ACT study combined cognitive rehabilitation but pushed it back into the ICU and in the hospital and continued it at home and combined it with early physical rehabilitation. And so our cognitive rehabilitation program consisted of performing a bunch of different uh, cognitive exercises, such as digit spans. And we designed this so patients could do this while they were even on the ventilator. So they had a booklet where they would point to the answers. So digit spans, we'd give them anything from a three to ten digit span. You know, you have to remember like your phone number or longer, but digits like that. And they'd have to point to them. We'd do that forwards. We'd do that backwards. We had patients perform matrix puzzles where you have to pick out the pattern here and choose one of these below that would go in there. I always get nervous that I'm going to choose the wrong one, but there it goes. <clears throat> and then real-world exercises like reading a bus schedule, figuring out you know, what time do you need to get on the bus to go to the 8 o'clock movie, uh, some recognizing patterns. Here we have to subtract 3, so 11, 8, and so on. So we had these patients do this twice a day for 20 minutes. 
And we enrolled 87 patients in this study, randomizing them to a one-to-one to two ratio. So usual care, physical therapy, and cognitive plus physical therapy. Again, mostly middle-aged men in our studies with a pretty high severity of illness. Nearly all patients were mechanically ventilated. Most of them were in our medical ICU, and most had sepsis or ARDS when they were admitted. Very low rates of pre-existing cognitive impairment and disability. And we were able to, this, this study was primarily focused on establishing the feasibility of the, of the proof of concept. So we were able to deliver this intervention to most patients while they were on the ventilator, while they were on the ICU, and during the hospitalization, and most days while they were there, 100% of days on all those. Uh, most patients received those interventions on most days. And then following that goal management training uh, program into the, the in-home setting, most patients performed goal management training, and we had six sessions, and so most received all six of those sessions. Now, this pilot study, we didn't demonstrate that similar change that we saw in the return study as far as the tower test scores or other measures of executive functioning or global cognition. But it, they did provide nice feasibility data to go on and study this further. And our intervention, you know, was pretty rudimentary. We had booklets. You know, I was a fellow when I was doing this. didn't have a lot of research funding. So we're getting in now to some of these technologies with iPads and other devices to be able to really engage patients, and, and we can learn a lot more about their cognitive functioning also while they're in the ICU. And so today we've talked about Long-term cognitive impairment and disability after critical illness, we've seen that patients can come into the ICU without these problems and they leave with significant problems, even young folks without comorbidities. We've explored a little bit about the vulnerability hypothesis and specifically the acute stressor of delirium in the ICU being predictive of both cognitive impairment and disability later. We've also looked at vulnerability, frailty being an important component. And I I think frailty is going to be an interesting thing because we can identify that at the outset. And that may change the way we take care of patients and and the conversations we have with them and their families. And then we've talked a little bit about our preliminary trials of cognitive rehabilitation for cognitive impairment after critical illness. And so that concludes my talk. This is our research group down at Vanderbilt. And I'd be interested in hearing any questions that you all have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so when I was training in pulmonary medicine, the mortality for acute lung injury was over 40, 50%. Right. And we were told that if a patient came out of the ICU and did well after acute lung injury, life was good. Right, right. Uh, and, and all of this data has been coming out over the past two decades suggesting that all we're doing is just uh, saving the patient from a primary illness but allowing a secondary one to appear. Right. One of the questions I have for you, and I have two. One is extrapolate the number of people who come out in the United States with cognitive impairment. You mm-hmm. said there were 3.5 million people going to the ICU. Right. What percent of those come out? Is it 300 to 500,000? So in the brain ICU study, 75% of patients had some form of cognitive impairment, that, that standard deviation and a half or worse. Good. Um, so that so that would be you know pretty pretty significant proportion, and as we see you know dementia increasing in this country, we wonder is this a is this a you know contributor to dementia? And when we start to look at things like the the neuropsychological profile, they're not quite exactly like Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've done some preliminary studies of imaging, and there's not a lot of of, uh, of amyloid in their brains. So it's, so it's looking like this may be a, a new, um, not Alzheimer's-like thing, which, which increases our enthusiasm for rehabilitation. It may be something, you know, we've, you know, these trials and all these brain games and things on, the, on TV that you see advertised aren't really effective for Alzheimer's disease, but it may be the case that this is a fully rehabilitatable brain injury that people are seeing. But it's a significant burden, particularly as people, you know, bring, you know, we excluded patients who had pre-existing problems in that study. So it may be even higher among those who have dementia. I was intrigued by your data correlating delirium and days with delirium mm-hmm. uh, with mortality. Right. And it almost suggests that you were implying that there is a cause and effect here. Yeah. As opposed to delirium being a manifestation of right. worse illness. Right. Because if it is a manifestation, treating delirium ain't going to do the trick. 
That's so tell me about cause yeah. and effect. Yeah, so these are... And is delirium a yeah. manifestation, or is delirium actually causative? Right, so we don't know if it's causative or not. These are observational trials, so there's always the possibility of some residual confounding things we didn't measure that could be associated with that. But in those studies, we've adjusted for severity of illness. And even in that brain IC study, we adjusted for daily severity of illness. So we get, and rather than just how sick they were when they came in. So we don't know that it's a, that it's a cause, but it's certainly strongly associated with mortality, cognitive impairment, and those other outcomes. And so our work now is also focusing on treatment of delirium and prevention of delirium as a way to reduce cognitive impairment and potentially mortality as well.